Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jamie Dumas, and I'm the communications manager here at Welcome MD. If you are new to Welcome MD, we are a concierge medicine practice with offices in Richmond, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Mooresville, North Carolina. We are very excited to be joined by Amanda Harris today to help kickstart the new year in a healthy way by sharing tips and tricks for working out when you don't want to. Amanda is an exercise physiologist who specializes in addressing the aches and pains resulting from your modern life. She has a master's degree in exercise physiology from the University of Virginia, and she has extensive experience in post-rehabilitative and medical exercise. Amanda is also passionate about helping people return to the activities that they enjoy after injury or surgery, and she works with people both individually and in class settings. If you have any questions for Amanda during the program, you can submit them via the Q&A feature. If you look at the bottom of your screen, if you are joining us live on Zoom, you will see um, a box that says Q&A. You just click that and you can submit your questions to Amanda and she will answer them at the end of her presentation. So feel free, anytime a question pops to your mind, go ahead and, and put it in there and we will answer them at the end. Um, so with that, Amanda, I will hand it over to you to get us started this evening. Okay, thank you, Jamie, and welcome to everyone out there, pun totally intended. Um, I appreciate your joining me this evening to talk about some tips and tricks for working out when you don't really want to. So we've got a few objectives that I would like to cover tonight, um, three specifically. The first is I want to discuss why the New Year's resolution and other exercise goal setting practices don't seem to be working for you because I'm guessing that if you're on this call, if you're on this webinar, then you've been a little frustrated by some of the goal setting practices practices or strategies you've used in the past, or maybe the New Year's resolutions that you've really worked hard to craft and why they haven't been working. So we're going to talk about why they haven't been working. And even more importantly, we'll talk about secrets to developing lifelong exercise habits. So this is really, of course, geared toward exercise and movement, um, trying to get you to live a healthier, um, more mobile life. And then third, we want to really determine the type of exercise for you so you can meet and exceed your goals. And I added this third little tip in here because I often find when I'm working with folks who are trying to get into the habit of exercise that they've picked an, a type of exercise that really doesn't resonate with him with them. And that can be a real you know, sort of trend stopper there. You're, you're not gonna really want to do something that you don't enjoy. So we need to zero in on the type of exercise that really works for you so that you can achieve what you want to here. So I'm hoping you've got a pen and some paper because I've got a lot of really good material here for you tonight. And as Jamie mentioned, I hope you'll send her some questions so that we can um, make sure all your questions get answered at the end of our program here. Now, before I move on, I wanna also mention that I'm gonna be referencing two books in, uh, in particular that I think are very, very helpful in establishing new habits and even breaking ones that just really don't serve you at all. Um, those two books are The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg and Atomic Habits by James Clear. So you're going to hear me reference both of these books throughout the program. And um, I highly recommend them if you want to read more about some of the things that you learned tonight. Uh, both books delve into the science. I think Duhigg's book is, is much more into the science. Uh, James Clear's book is much more into like strategies that you can implement right away. He, he brushes on the science and he also references Duhigg a lot. So both of them great books if you wanna learn a little bit more about some of the tips and tactics I give you tonight. So let's move forward and talk about my first objective, which is to help you understand why, up to this point anyhow, New Year's resolutions or maybe just goal setting strategies in general have not worked for you to develop this exercise habit. So one of the things that I have found over the years in working with people, and this is also referenced in both of these books, is that often when you're looking at setting a goal for exercise, you haven't really considered why you want to exercise. So a poorly defined why is one of those blocks to establishing a good exercise habit. We're going to jump into all these in a little bit more detail here shortly. Um, secondly, your focus, the, the focus of the goal itself 
is on something that is out of your control. Now that's really important because if your outcome, if the goal that you're headed toward is not something that is under your direct control, you're gonna become really frustrated. So we've gotta get that focus onto something that is directly under your control. The third point is lack of clarity. Now, I, I find this one pretty interesting because what a lot of folks tell me is that they lack the motivation to keep the exercise habit going. But what James Clear refers to in his book, Atomic Habits, is that often when people say they lack motivation, what they really lack is clarity, which is exactly what they're supposed to do when they are executing their routine. So we're gonna dive into that a little deeper as well. Um, fourth is the unsupportive environment. Now, I'm not necessarily just talking about naysayers because it's certainly true that if you have people around your office or around your home that are not supportive of you developing a new exercise habit, it's gonna make it much harder for you to succeed. But I'm also talking about your surroundings. So we need to create a more supportive environment for your exercise habit to really succeed in 2021. And then the last reason that goal setting strategies often fail around exercise is you absolutely hate what you're doing. And if you hate what you're doing, you're simply not going to do it, as I mentioned before. So we'll need to figure out how to find activities that you really enjoy to get you started. All right, so let's go ahead and embark on how to find your why. Now, this is often also called your compelling reason. So when you think about finding your why, I also want you to think of it as your compelling reason to exercise. Why do you want to exercise? Not just why, what is your compelling reason? What is gonna get you over your inertia to actually start to exercise on a regular basis? Um, now, these th three things that are up here are what I often hear when I first ask this question of a new client. And to be honest with you, I don't do a lot of in-depth goal setting in my current practice. But as many of you probably know, I have done a lot of goal setting with some of the Welcome MD participants over the last couple of years. I've had the privilege of being in that role and have really enjoyed getting to know some of you. And often when I ask, why do you want to start exercising? I hear something like this. I want to look good at my fill in the blank event, which um, obviously that's usually a short term why. So that's never really a great why because it expires, right? So you want to find something that doesn't expire. Now, these other two things don't necessarily expire, but they're also pretty nebulous. I want to lose weight. Um, maybe it's because I want to look good in my clothes. Maybe it's because I'm concerned about my health, but, or maybe it's just because somebody, spouse, physician, um, you know, put it, fill in the blank has suggested that I need to lose weight. Um, or maybe it's because I feel like exercising regularly will improve my health, right? But those are still a little bit too nebulous. So we need to dig a little bit deeper. Th those are, those are nice things to say, they're objectives, but they are not going to get you out of bed and make you exercise when you really don't want to. So let's dig a little deeper. So often when I hear those first surfacey reasons of why folks want to exercise, I start digging and I say, okay, well, what will that give you? What will losing weight give you? What will improving your health give you? What happens when you achieve that outcome? And so then I might hear something like, well, then I'll be able to keep up with my kids or my grandkids. Um, and then if I really keep digging, I'll hear something even more sort of important. Like I want to be able to walk my granddaughter down the aisle at her wedding because her father can't be there or I need to be physically able to care for an ailing loved one. So let me, let me take a little side trip here and, and tell you some examples of some of these reasons that may sound still not very um, strong to you. But the first one came up when I was talking to a woman about uh, why she wanted to start exercising. And at first she said she really wanted to lose weight and get in shape. And I said, well, what would that give you? And she says, well, I need to be able to keep up with my grandson. And I asked her about that. I said, what does that mean? Are you going to play with him? Are you going to you know, run around with him? Are you going to play with him on the playground? And she got a little bit 
embarrassed and told me of a situation where she was at, I believe it was the Living Museum in Newport News and she had her grandson for the day and she was walking him around and it was a pretty crowded Saturday. And he got excited, he saw something and he took off, he let go of her hand. And she panicked because he ran through a crowd and she couldn't run to keep up with him. She was too out of shape. She was a little overweight and she was scared to death that she was gonna lose her grandson that day. Um, she did eventually find him, happy ending, but she said, I never want that to happen again. Now folks, that's a really compelling why. This lady really wanted to make sure that if he ran off, she could actually run off after him, not run a marathon, but at least run after him. So that really got her started on her journey of becoming an exerciser. So one thing I'll insert this little, this little vignette is that um, another thing James Clear says right at the beginning of his book, Atomic Habits, that I love, is that the goal is not to exercise regularly. The goal is to become a lifelong exerciser. So as you're developing the exercise habit, it's not just about what you wanna do, but it's about what you wanna become. So these habits actually wind up defining us, right? So she wants to keep up with that grandchild so that she can be a better grandparent. Now, the second one came to me when I talked to a gentleman who told me he wanted to walk his granddaughter down the aisle because she had lost her father at a young age. And he felt very strongly that he needed to be there for her when she got married. And then I asked him how old his granddaughter was. He said she was 12. So that... That, oh, that always chokes me up. But that is a really major compelling reason to start an exercise program. All right, I'm gonna recover here, folks. Um, the third one that I threw up here, being physically able to care for an ailing loved one, um, that's an example, but the one that really comes to mind was I spoke with a lady one day who told me that her child was autistic and she realized that when he grows up, he's not gonna be able to fully care for himself and she needs to be physically able and healthy enough to really care for him as long as she possibly can. Now, none of these reasons came up when I first asked these folks why they wanted to exercise, but as I'm describing them to you, I hope they're hitting a chord with you like they did me. Those always sort of sock me in the chest. I always know they're in there, but boy, when I hear them, I know I've hit it, and you will too. So when this session is over, I don't want you to throw this out. I want you to take some time and really dive deep, and if you need to ask a friend or a spouse or a loved one to go through this exercise with you and keep asking why, what will that give you? What will that give you until you hit this chord? Please take the time to do it because it literally can be the difference between success in achieving that becoming an exerciser or failure in feeling like you're back to the drawing board once again. So finding your why, terribly, terribly important. Now let's get into crafting the goal because of course, when we're talking about exercise, there's always a goal involved, or at least for most people, there's a goal. Um, I often refer to this goal as more of an objective because we're gonna talk more about what I think goals are in just a moment. But most of you are gonna think of the things that are on this slide as a goal. Lose 30 pounds, lower my blood pressure, improve arthritis or, avo or avoid joint replacement. I hear those sort of hand in hand a lot. And for most people, those sound like a goal, but I would argue that if you've been in this game long enough and you've been through goal setting enough, somebody has told you that it needs to be a SMART goal, right? This should be familiar to most of you, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time sensitive. And so then we can go back to our, our goals here and we can say, okay, well, we can make we can make these SMART goals, right? So I can say losing 30 pounds, that's pretty specific. Is it measurable? Yes, I can measure 30 pounds on a scale. Is it attainable? Well, let's think about what attainable would be. Maybe the time frame is like a year. That could be attainable. Is it realistic? Sure, that could be realistic if I do all the things I need to do to achieve that weight loss. And is it time sensitive? Yes, I gave it a year. If we wanna make it even more specific than that, then we can say January 12th in 2022, I will have lost 30 pounds. So that technically is a SMART goal, but I would argue there's still a problem with these goals, folks. Even if you go through that SMART exercise with each, with each of these three goals, there is still a problem. And the problem is none of these things is under your direct control. None of them is. So take a moment and think about that. 
Yes, you could say that exercise is a vehicle through which you can lose 30 pounds. Exercise will absolutely contribute to, contribute to lowering your blood pressure. Exercise can absolutely contribute to improving arthritic joints and helping you avoid joint replacement. But can you control how much and when? And the answer is no. So what I'd rather you do, and this is all in the literature of those two books I talked about and beyond, is start with a behavioral goal because you can control what you do and what you don't do, right? You can control what you do and what you don't do. You can't control where the scale goes. You can't control where the blood pressure readings go. You can't control what your joints do on a daily basis in terms of improving their arthritic condition, but you absolutely can choose a behavioral goal. So I ask you, what do you need to do to accomplish your objectives of losing 30 pounds or lowering your blood pressure or improving your arthritis to avoid joint replacement? What do you need to do to achieve those things? So that gets you starting to think, right? You start thinking, okay, well, I, I need to exercise. Obviously, that's at least part of it. I need to exercise. Some of you are already thinking about what types of exercise you might do to lose 30 pounds or to lower your blood pressure. Maybe it's 10 pounds. I chose 30 arbitrarily. But you're starting to think about this a little bit, right? What do I need to do? Now, the next little gem about crafting this goal is not just thinking about what you need to do, but doing something small. So often when I talk to folks about starting an exercise program, they have some big plans. And I hear about five day a week exercise regimens that are gonna go for about an hour at a time, maybe 30 minutes of cardio and 30 minutes of weight training or yoga or Pilates or you know, pick your activity. And um, I can, often, I can honestly tell you that that often winds up being, you know, a, a great start because you're so motivated to get started. And then you quickly find that it just doesn't work for you for myriad reasons, but it doesn't work for you. So what if we go the opposite direction? Don't worry about the CDC guidelines yet. Don't worry about what you know, experts, quote unquote experts have told you about what you need to do with exercise in terms of time and intensity and type and all that good stuff. Start really small. What is something small you can do to move toward your goal every day? Now, as much as we all want you, we all being, we all experts want you to eventually embrace more and more exercise over your lifetime, the thing that we want more than anything is for you to keep this habit up as a lifelong habit. We want you to become the exerciser, not just exercise. So let me give you a little bit more insight about this go small thing. Again, this is from Atomic Habits, and this is a graph that um, Clear uses in his book. And he talks about getting 1% better every day. Now, don't get too literal with this, because if we talk about 1% of an hour, it's like six minutes or something. We don't need to go there. But what I want you to think of is if you improve, and this is amazing, this is like compounding interest if you're talking to a financial planner and you're really trying to build wealth. It's the same thing with goals and exercise. And I love this. If you get 1% better every day for 365 days of the year, at the end of the year, you are 37.78% better than when you began. Compounding interest, pretty cool, right? But if you get 1% worse every day, you basically wind back up at zero. And I find that's amazing. It's, it's sort of shocking data, but it's really wonderful. And it's very empowering because it reminds you that if you can do something small every single day and get 1% better, whatever that better means, then you will wind up 37% ahead at the end of the year. Pretty awesome, closer to 38, right? So let's talk about what that means um, in terms of exercise. And um, before we go on into the, the types of exercise and that sort of thing, I wanna, I wanna take this little segue into 
what you need to do to build this small behavioral goal. Because remember, I mentioned earlier that lack of clarity often becomes sort of stated as lack of motivation. So we need to get super crystal clear about this little behavioral goal that we're gonna set for ourselves every single day. And when I say get crystal clear, you've got to figure out what you're gonna do, when you're gonna do it, where you're gonna do it, and for how long. So what, when, where, and how long. All right, so let's go into what. So the what is what type of exercise are you gonna do? And it may be types of exercise. You might have a multifaceted plan, but I'm gonna beg you if you have been frustrated with getting on the regular exercise bandwagon in the past, I'm gonna beg you to keep this super simple and have some wins under your belt before you start complicating it. So let's start with basic, basic. What do you like to do? Um, now, that can go from anything like walking, cycling, things that are sort of readily available to, and I've heard these before, kayaking, mountain climbing, scuba diving. You know, we can wind up with some pretty far-flung activities that we really can't access right now. You may be even thinking about a machine in the gym and you're thinking, there's no way in heck I'm going back to that gym right now. And, and I get that. I understand that. So my first question is, what do you really like to do activity-wise? And then the second question is, can you do that? Do you have access to it? Is it something that you can really do right now? And if the answer is, no, I really don't have access to it right now, then what could you do to get as close as possible to it? So take a moment and think about all the activities that are available to you, what's accessible, and what you can actually start doing tomorrow so that you can start to move little tiny bits on a daily basis. And you're gonna to have to think pretty simple. You might have to think about walking or cycling or I don't know, swimming if a pool is available, but I know those are sort of in short supply right now too. Is there a piece of exercise equipment you could buy and have in your home? So what do you like to do? Can you do it? And if not, how close can you get to it? Write that down and figure out what that is. That's number one on getting clear. Number two, when are you going to do this activity? So first, you got to figure out when you can fit this into your week or into your day. So I often tell folks when they start out, if they, if they want to do something every single day, like seven days a week or even five days a week, I try to get them down to maybe two days a week, which sounds so backwards, doesn't it? An exercise physiologist saying, no, let's not start with five. Let's start with two days. You know, folks start to chuckle and say, am I crazy? But what I want them to do is rack up some successes under their belt. And I'm saying that to you too. Can you fit this in two days a week? And if you say, well, I've, I've been able to fit it in two days a week. What I can't seem to do is fit it in more than that. Then fine, let's start with three days a week. But when can you fit this into your week? So make that commitment first and please don't bite off more than you can chew. And then the second piece of this is when can you fit this into your day? Now, be careful because this can be quicksand. When you fit this into your day, if you say to me, I'm a morning exerciser or I'm an evening exerciser or I'm a lunchtime exerciser, that's great, but tell me what time you're gonna do it. Because what happens with folks who say, I'm going to exercise in the morning is, well, let's just pick a typical Murphy's Law day, right? Your alarm clock doesn't go off on time. So you wake up late, you're rushed, you sort of make it somehow through your shower and your cup of coffee. And then you're thinking, okay, now maybe I can exercise. And then your child can't find their homework. So you help them for 10 minutes finding their homework. And then once they find their homework, you're spouse's car won't start. So now you've got to jump the battery. Does this sound familiar? I mean, you could go on and on and on, right? And your whole morning just got wrecked. However, maybe you can fit this in at 11 a.m. every day, or maybe you fit it in like I do, which I don't, I know it's not for everybody, but I literally get up at five o'clock in the morning before anybody else in my house gets up so I can get my exercises done before anybody starts chewing on me about anything else, right? But that might not work for you. What if it's noon? What if it's part of your lunch break? 
What if it's right after work? Now, here's the other question is, what's your rhythm? So if you know that there is no way in heck you're getting up before 7 a.m., please don't say that you're gonna do it at 5 a.m. If you know that you are an evening exerciser, then it's gotta be in the evening. But my point here is pick a time, schedule it, and schedule it in a way that it's non-negotiable. Make it every bit as important as your most important meeting of the day. Now, I realize that even that can get blown up. And we're going to talk about getting around obstacles and having plan Bs in a few minutes as well. But my point here is, one, you got to know your rhythm. What time of day do you exercise best and feel good about it? And then two, you're going to have to make an appointment for yourself. Now, here's the other good news. Remember, we talked about making it small. So we're not talking about blocking an hour of time here. We might be talking about blocking 10 or 15 minutes. Do you think you could do that? I bet everybody on this call could block 10 or 15 minutes in a day for their, themselves. Because if you were not interested in making this happen, you wouldn't be here, right? All right, let's talk about where. So we're, we're talking about being really clear and specific, right? We're talking about we've defined what type of exercise or activity we're going to do. And folks, it might be stretching to begin with. That's okay. That's not a sin. I just want you to move. So you're going to pick an activity. And then we've talked about when you're going to do it. You're going to schedule this on your calendar so that it's as important as your most important meeting. So third, you got to choose where, because if you say to yourself, well, you know, I can't exercise at the gym now, but maybe I'll get out and go for a walk around U of R campus at lunchtime. But, you know, to get there, you're going to have to drive 15 minutes or something, and then there's traffic, and then there's, oh, when am I going to eat my lunch? And then there's the guy that, you know, wants a piece of you right before you leave the office. So, so really think about where you're going to do your exercise and make sure that it's not very hard to get there. Ideally, it's right where you are right? You don't have to drive anywhere. I realized when everybody was going to the gym, you always had to drive to the gym. But you know what? Sometimes the uh, activation energy, if I can call it that, of getting to the gym is enough to make you want to just drive home. So you've got to figure out where you're going to do your exercise. It's got to be easy to access. You got to get there easily. It can't be a headache to get there. It can't be one of those things where you see all the red on your traffic map and decide that you're just going to go home instead. And then the third thing I'll ask you about where is, do you have what you need there? So if you are going to work out at the office, did you pack workout clothes? Did you pack shoes that you can work out in or clothes that you can easily move in? You know, you don't want to be in tight jeans or something that are restrictive. And then if you've chosen an outdoor venue, you're probably going to need some weather contingencies, right? Especially right now, since it seems to not be able to stop raining in Richmond. So really think about where you're going to make your exercise happen. And if it needs to change from day to day, that's okay. It doesn't have to be in the exact same spot. But let me offer you this little gem. Make sure that you have it on your schedule, not just when you're going to do what you're going to do, but where you're going to do it. So you will know. There will be no guessing. There's not going to be any vacillating. There's not going to be any, oh, where should I go today? You know exactly where you're going to go to do your movement, your exercise, your activity. All right. Now, how long will you go? So I keep making reference to starting small and doing maybe 10 or 15 minutes worth of movement, because guess what? This is the coolest part of this. If you will commit to that 10 or 15 minutes, how many times do you think you're going to keep going a little bit longer? I bet you will. I talked to a neighbor this weekend who was walking down our road and he pulled me aside and he said, you know, I know that you do all this, you know, rehab and exercise type stuff. And I wonder if you can help me. And I said, absolutely. What can I do for you? And he said, how do I get rid of this? And he pats himself on the belly, you know, and I kind of laughed and my husband laughed. And, you know, my husband made some reference to putting down the second hamburger and then we all laughed. But but then I asked him about walking because he was out walking that day. And he said, you know, I try. I try to get in an hour. And, and folks, when people tell me they're trying to do something, they're not fully committed. You know that, right? Anytime you tell someone you're going to try to do something, you're really giving yourself an out. So he says he says to me, I try to get an hour in um, every day. 
And I said, how many times have you done that? And he said, well, I started January 1. And I said, good for you. Now, bear in mind, this was on Sunday. So that would have been the 10th, right? And he said, and I've done it six times. And I said, well, that's awesome. I said, it sounds like you missed a few days. And he sort of laughed and blushed. And I said, what if you did 10 minutes a day? If you want to do it every day, I said, you really want to do it every day? He said, Amanda, I'm going to do it every day. I said, great. How about 10 minutes a day? And he looked at me and he said, is that going to work? And I said, would you do it? And he said, yes. And I said, what if it's kind of cold and nasty and sort of spit and rain like it has been the last few you know, weeks on and off? Would you actually come out in the rain? He said, oh, I could do anything for 10 minutes. I said, could you really? He said, yeah. I said, well, then why don't you start there? And then he said, but if I want to walk for an hour on a nice day like today, can I do that? I said, of course, right? So if you can commit to 10 minutes, even if it's two days a week, what do you think? You think you might stay a little bit longer some days because it's feeling good? I think you would. So if you make that commitment, a minimal commitment, and you allow yourself to go over when you feel like going over, you're going to win. You're going to be ahead of that 37%, right, by the end of the year, because you can always increase. I just don't want you to decrease. Okay. So that's talking about how long you can go. Okay. So we're really getting clear on our goals here. We're talking about what we're going to do, we've chosen an activity. You may not have chosen it yet. You may still have some head work to do on this, but hopefully you wrote down the variable. You're going to really zero in on the activity that you like most to do, or at least the least worst thing you can do, right? You've also talked about when you're going to do it. You're going to schedule it on your calendar. It's going to have a time. It's committed just like a, um, like a meeting, something that you absolutely must attend because you must attend this. You've talked about where you're going to do it. You're going to make sure that you have what you need and that you know exactly where you're supposed to do it because that's going to go on the calendar too. And now you're going to have, let's say, a 10-minute minimum. And maybe some of you out there have said, well, are thinking, I wonder if I could do a five-minute minimum. Sure, the minimum is the minimum, but the minimum must be minded. Okay, let's talk about obstacles because we all have them. And they come up and we have Murphy's Law days. I know I've had a couple myself even in the last couple of weeks. So it pays to do a little bit of head work ahead of time and say to yourself, now that I have scheduled my awesome 10 minutes of exercise, what could possibly get in the way? And then I want you to list it all. You know, I gave you that really terrible Murphy's Law Day about the alarm clock going off late and the kid losing their homework and the spouse's car having a dead battery. But you can imagine plenty of other things that can get in the way of your success of scheduling your exercise. And I want you to take the time to list them out, no matter how outrageous they are, put them in a long list. And then I want you to identify your plan B. All of us should have a plan B, which is if I fail to get my exercise in at my prescribed time, at my committed time, what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? If you're curious, maybe you're not, but I bet some of you are. If you're curious about what my plan B is, because I always say that my, my plan A is my five o'clock AM exercise. And like other people, there are times where that does not work for me. There are times where my daughter has nightmares all night long and I'm up and down with her all night long and I cannot get out of bed at five because I'm going to be a zombie for my clients. So I have to sleep a little bit later. What's my plan B? Well, my plan B is that I give myself about 20 minutes at lunchtime to do some mobility exercises. Now, that's not the same as the cardio exercise that I often do or the strength training exercise that I often do, but it's movement and it keeps me on track and it makes me feel really good. So I don't feel like I've lost any headway in that day. So what is your plan B? It may not be the same as your plan A and that's okay, but you need to have a plan B. <clears throat> All right, third, you need to know about the U-turn. Now, the concept of the U-turn is from a book I, I read years ago. I want to say it was popular in the 90s. Some of you may be familiar with it. It was a book that was written by Mehmet Oz and Michael Royzen called You on a Diet. Isn't it funny that I'm quoting You on a Diet? Somebody gave it to me years ago. I think it was a client. And they said, this is the most outstanding book. You've got to read this. And I thought, why do I want to read a diet book? But folks, it's a really fun book. And if you're looking for something that gives you a bunch of fun, sort of tongue in cheek, anecdotal ways to help yourself turn into a healthy lifestyle, don't think about it as a diet. Um, that's a really fun book. 
So I recommend that. It's um, it, like I said, it's very tongue in cheek, but they came up with this concept called the U-turn spelled Y-O-U. And I absolutely love it. And I still use it. And the U-turn is all about not doing the what the heck move. And I think the what the heck move is talked about in Charles Duhigg's book, but the what the heck move goes something like this. You've been on a great track. You've been getting your exercise in. You've been meeting your behavioral goal every day. Let's say it's been going great, like great guns for about a month and a half. You have not missed a day, or if you have, you've done a plan B. Everything is fantastic. And then something happens. You get sick. God forbid, I don't want anybody to get sick, but let's say you get a bad cold. We'll just say that or your car breaks down and you can't get to where you need to go, or something happens that completely obliterates not just plan A, but plans B and C too. And maybe that happens for a couple of days. This can happen on vacation. It can happen um, during the holidays, but it somehow obliterates your forward momentum with your habit. And what these guys were saying was, when that happens to you, instead of saying, oh, what the heck, it was never going to work anyway, which is what a lot of folks do. And maybe you've done it in the past. But instead of doing that, this time you make a U-turn. And the U-turn is simply to say, all right, I got off track. And tomorrow at this time, I am getting back on track. Or even better yet, you say to yourself, I'm gonna do something right now to get back on track. Now, remember I told you that my plan B is some mobility work. It's not even a full workout. It's just some stretching and some mobility work. What if your U-turn consists of you saying, yep, I got off track and right now I'm gonna do five minutes of stretching and that gets me back on track. Yes, it's psychological. It sounds sort of, you know, silly, but it totally works. So I want you to remember the U-turn. When the obstacles come up, if plan B gets obliterated, if plan C gets obliterated, make a U-turn. All right. Hopefully y'all are still following me. Um, the next little piece I want to talk about is your environment. So I mentioned in the beginning that an unsupportive environment, <clears throat> excuse me, an unsupportive environment can get in the way of success when you're trying to establish your exercise habit. So what we need to do is optimize the environment. So studies show, and both my habit books that I have uh, cited for you tonight talk about this particular study, but both, and both of them say that the studies show that if you can make your start for your exercise more accessible, i.e. within five seconds of your time to get it going, then you are more likely to succeed. So you need to make this habit super accessible. I put a piece of, uh, I put a picture of shoes up here because one of the uh, great tactics that are mentioned in both books and in some studies is that if you're trying to start a walking habit, for instance, you put your shoes right in front of the door. So you literally have to trip over them to get out of the door. Um, <clears throat> so that's one way to look at it. There are other ways to do it. I can tell you personally, what I do is every night I lay out my exercise clothes on the bathtub in the bathroom. And the first place I go when I get up in the morning is a bathroom, probably like a lot of you all. And guess what's staring me in the face? My exercise clothes. So it's not even a decision anymore. They're sitting right there. And after I finish brushing my teeth, I put on my exercise clothes and that's where I go. So really find something that makes exercise really accessible. I remember talking to somebody during quarantine, doing a virtual session over quarantine, and they were saying that they do exercise videos and um, they really find it, you know, sort of frustrating because they actually go through their video cabinet. Yeah, like DVDs, they're, they're not digitally downloading. I know some of y'all are probably thinking, wow, why wouldn't you just download? But some of us still use DVDs, but they're going through their DVD cabinet trying to select a video to use for exercise. Well, that's a huge waste of time. And if you're thinking about it beforehand, you're probably thinking, gosh, if I'm gonna go exercise, I gotta go find a video and then I've gotta load it up and I gotta turn on the TV and turn on the DVD player. No, you don't wanna do any of that when it's time to exercise. You wanna have all of that figured out ahead of time. So maybe the night before you choose your DVD, you have it sitting on top of the DVD player, the remote control's right there, you can find it instantly your clothes are there, your equipment's there. You've got to have things ready so that it's easy for you to start. 
We need to make it easy for you to say, yes, I'm going to continue. Um, so one of the things that they talk about in the power of habit is don't worry so much about the finish, about that end goal of 30 pounds. Worry more about starting every day. That's a pretty important point, starting every day. So make it easy to start. If there are barriers to your success, if clothes are stuck in dressers and you're having to dig through dressers to find your clothes, if shoes are underneath a pile of other shoes, um, if it's difficult to get to where you wanna go exercise because it's between you and a heap of rush hour traffic, you've gotta figure out how you can remove some of those barriers so that it's easier to start. So you may even need to sit down and think about what barriers could come up, whether it's traffic, whether it's um, children who need help with schoolwork, whatever it is, you're gonna have to figure out how to remove some barriers. It may even be meaning making an agreement with some family members that this is mom or dad's exercise time and you're gonna have to leave me alone for the next 10 or 15 minutes if you want me to be a good parent. <laughs> I've had to make that agreement before myself. Um, another little cue to success in the environment is gonna be to create a cue. So something that trips your memory. Now that can be a post-it note on a doorway or maybe a post-it note on every doorway. You know, post-it notes don't actually tear the paint off. So you can usually get away with it. Be careful that it doesn't come in, doesn't turn into background. You know, you don't want to leave it up there so long that you no longer see it. But you can use little things like a post-it note in a doorway that maybe even has a symbol on it. Maybe it's just a smiley face. And that's your cue that you need to remember to exercise that day. Maybe it's the shoes in front of the door. Um, maybe it's the dog that needs to go for a walk. You know, you, maybe you leave a leash by the door. Maybe the dog is the cue. Maybe the dog cues you himself. But create a cue so that it trips your memory and your sort of um, excitement about doing whatever activity it is that you're about to do. And then another point that I think is really good that, that Duhigg outlines, because he's the big proponent of creating a cue, but he's also a big proponent of choosing a reward. Now, I'm going to show you a slide in a few minutes where he, he basically has the routine being an exercise routine and the rewards a candy bar or something, and I don't really recommend that for obvious reasons. But it could be something else. It could be that um, you get a 30-minute relaxing bath at the end of the week if you make all your behavioral goals, or maybe it's something like you get to spend a little extra time reading a book, or um, maybe it's you get to spend a little extra time catching up with a friend or something. But you can choose a reward that works for you and hopefully doesn't inadvertently sabotage all the reasons that you're exercising, right? So really, when you're talking about optimizing the environment, it's more than just people. And you might have to face people. You might have to talk to coworkers or you know, spouses or family members and tell them what you're really wanting to do and that this is very important to you and you need their support. Uh, and I strongly recommend that too, because if they don't know what you're doing or they think that it's just another fad that you're going through and you're going to get rid of it in a month or two, then they're not going to be supportive and they might even get in the way. But if you explain to them how important this is to you and that you need their support, most of the time, I think you'll find them pretty supportive. At least I hope so for your sake. All right, so we're gonna move on and talk about the routine itself. So Duhigg in A Power of Habit, in The Power of Habit talks about creating this routine. Now, early on in the presentation, we talked about getting very specific and clear <clears throat> about what type of exercise you're doing, when you're doing it, like literally down to the minute, 11.15 on Tuesday morning, I'm going to be exercising where? around my office building, I'm gonna walk around the office building or whatever it is that you've committed to, but you're gonna be super specific about what you're doing, the time you're doing it, where you're gonna do it, and how long you're gonna do it for. And so when you commit to that routine, one of the things that Duhigg suggests is map it out. Now you can do this little diagram like he did where he shows his cue being the shoes by the door, for instance, and then his routine is walking or running, whatever that is. And then his reward is a chocolate bar. Like I said, I think that's probably not a great reward. But one of the things that he says in his book is that this is how habit loops form. There's always a cue that makes you start the behavior. Then you go through the routine behavior and then there's something rewarding at the end. And you know, for some of us, that reward is just feeling good. 
feeling like we did something really good. For others, it might need to be something external and that's okay. But choose whatever that is and maybe draw it or even write it out. So down below, you see he wrote it out. This year, when I see my shoes by the door, I will go on a walk or run or whatever it is in order to get my candy bar. I really hate that. But you know, pick something that works for you. And you can draw it or write it, whatever whatever suits you best, because some of you are gonna be more visual and it's gonna make more sense to see the symbols. Some of you are going to want to see it written out or you might need to write it three or four times. Remember that from school, <laughs> write this 12 times, that might work for you. So as you're committing to your routine, you can write it, you can draw it, you can post it on post-it notes and put it all over your home, on your refrigerator, on the dashboard of your car. Um, you can put it on the back of your phone. You can put it in your calendar. So something that tends to be real satisfying um, that nobody has to know what it is, is you can choose a color. It doesn't have to be red. I read somewhere you could put a red X, but it doesn't have to be red. It could be blue or purple or your favorite color, whatever that is. And you can put an X over every single day that you meet your behavioral goal on your calendar. And by the end of the month, it's real satisfying to see all those beautiful X's or maybe it's a circle. Maybe an X is a little negative. Maybe you want a circle. Um, maybe it's a green circle. But whatever symbol thing you want to come up with, don't make it so elaborate that it's hard to do, but put it on your calendar and enjoy marking it off. So depending on your personality and what really helps you sort of cue you into the moment, whether it's something like your calendar, whether it's the post-it note, or whether it's writing something down over and over again, commit to this new routine and all the specifics that go with it, and that will help you be successful. Um, the last little tip that I'm going to give you is to get an accountability partner. You've probably heard that before, um, and you may have tried that before and it didn't really pan out for you, but maybe you didn't have the best accountability partner. So accountability partners come in all shapes and sizes. They can be children, they can be grandchildren, they can be mothers, they can be fathers, grandmothers, co-workers, um, friends, you know, anybody that you feel like gets you and really wants to pull for you and help you be successful in a perfect world they're trying to do something really similar if not exactly the same thing and that way you can motivate each other and really cheer each other on and I think that's probably the most fun accountability partner you can have now the other type of accountability partner that you can obviously get is a professional accountability partner you could choose a trainer you could choose a fitness or wellness coach um, you know any professional that can help sort of excite you towards this goal and keep you moving forward. That's what the, the power of an accountability partner is. And, and folks, with modern technology, it can even happen over the miles, right? You can have an accountability partner on the other side of the country if you want, because you can text each other. So that's sort of the wonders of, of modern times is you can actually do this virtually um, and that's real helpful right now during this pandemic, or you can do it with somebody who's in your immediate family that you see every day anyway. All right, so let's go over what we went through tonight and, and just summarize this and hopefully make sure you got all the points that are going to work the best for you. First, we talked about uncovering and embracing your why. And remember, you want to really dig deep. Don't stay on the surface with this. If you need to have somebody help you dig deep, then get somebody to ask you more questions. What does that give you? When you get there, what happens for you? How does that change you? You know, ask really strong questions like that so that you'll do the mental work to whittle down to the most compelling reason that you want to become a lifelong exerciser. Secondly, you're going to craft a SMART because even though we talked about behavior goals, it's still specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time sensitive, right? All of those boxes are checked and it's going to be clear knowing what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, how long you're going to do it behavioral goal. Why? Because behavioral goals are directly within our control. Remember goals outside of our control, like looking at the numbers on a scale or looking at the numbers on a blood pressure gauge or measuring how many, you know, Celebrex you have to take in the morning for your knee, those sorts of things, not directly under your control. Well, the Celebrex is of course, but I think you understand my meaning there. 
You need to choose clear behavioral goals that are directly under your control. Choose an activity you like so that hopefully you don't dread it every day. Identify any obstacles that could get in the way of this clear behavioral goal and make a plan B. Shoot, go for a plan C if you need one, but make sure you've already addressed the obstacles so they don't shock you and flummox you when they arise. Make sure you have created a supportive environment, both with people and with things. Make your commitment. And when you make your commitment, you can write it, you can draw it, you can post it, you can use a calendar, whatever works for you to make your commitment. You can use a person, an accountability partner, right? And above all, just start. You can start now, right after we get off this call, right? Okay, so that really concludes my presentation. I wanted to give you these two references for these two wonderful books that I thoroughly enjoyed. As I mentioned, the folks that love the science are gonna like The Power of Habit a lot because there is an awful lot of science quoted in there. And then the folks who would rather have the, give me just the down and dirty, what do I do, are gonna enjoy Atomic Habits, but they're very consistent and complimentary. And I think both of them are excellent references as you're embarking on creating and maintaining this awesome new exercise habit of yours. So thank you so much for your time and attention tonight. And Jamie's getting ready to come back on to do some Q and A, but I did wanna say too, that if you wanna reach me, um, my email is right up there on the screen. And I do have a newsletter that tends to go out regularly, although we had a little hiccup over the holidays. So there's one that's due out here in the first quarter. So if you would like my newsletter, certainly let me know that. If you want more information about the services I offer at Reconnect, I would be happy to talk to you about those as well. So I'm looking forward to connecting with you sometime soon if I can help at all. All right, Jamie, I'm going to hand it back to you so we can do some questions. Yes. Thank you, Amanda. That was fantastic. I learned a lot myself. Um, if you all just saw something pop up, it is because I included a link to a form in the chat box. So it should be um, on all of your screens. So if you would like to provide anonymous feedback, um, about the program, feel free to do so with that link. Um, you can also include your name and email address if you want to just connect with Amanda. Um, she'll have that information then after the fact. Um, all right, it doesn't look like I have any questions yet, but we are available for any questions that you all might have. Um, if you just look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A button. You just hit that and submit any questions that you have there. I hope everybody's still out there. I always get nervous when there are no questions. It either means I did a really fantastic job or I put everybody to sleep. <laughs> well, you didn't put me to sleep, so. <laughs> All right, good to know. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> oh, here's a question. Okay, the question is, what book has the U-turn reference? Oh, that was You on a Diet, and that's by Mehmet Oz and Michael Roizen, and that's a book from the 90s. I actually might be able to look that up on my phone and find it for somebody, but um, yeah, it's called You on a Diet, and it's really not about diets, um, but it's a really cute book. I feel like it's really well done. Oh, I just got a comment here that you did a great job. So it wasn't oh, just me that you didn't put to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Any other questions from the group? Well, I have a question for you if you don't mind. Okay, absolutely. So as a mom of a young child, um, I'm not sure that the give me 15 minutes would work. So do you have a recommendation <laughs> for what to do uh -huh. to get some, it's like one of the things that I sometimes will do is I'll just act like it's really fun. And I'm like, why don't you work out with mom? And she doesn't actually work out with me because she's four, but she'll kind of sit and watch, which I think is probably good because she's seeing that it's important, you know, to be healthy, but I don't know. Do you have any other recommendations for how to get kids involved in this kind of stuff? Yes, that time? I actually do. Um, Cause I have an eight year old. So I went through that whole thing too. Uh, what I like to do, or at least what I did back then when, when there was no way she was going to give me any time to work out is do you, are you able to take her to a playground yet? Do you have a local playground you can take her to? 
Okay. So we would go to a playground and I would literally do whatever she did. So if she was going across monkey bars, I was going across monkey bars. If she was climbing up ladders, I was climbing up ladders, sliding down slides, swinging on swings. Um, we would chase each other around. We'd try balancing on things. So even though it's not a traditional workout, you, you can get a pretty good workout if you do what your kid does. It's pretty amazing. Like they, at the playground that we would frequent, there was a little, little mini climbing wall. And so she'd scramble up the climbing wall and I'd scramble up behind her. And yes, it was way easier for me, but I'm still climbing. So, you know, you're pulling, you're pushing, you're, you're doing all sorts of things. You can jump over stuff. Yeah. So you can give her like a little obstacle course and you can chase her through it, or she can chase you through it. I love that. Um, you can feel creative on a playground, yeah. but playgrounds are a great place to work out. And especially with kids, because kids are experts on exercise. It's just not the kind of exercise we think of as adults, but um, it's amazing exercise. <laughs> yes. So I would imagine if nothing else, you're still getting really active. All right. I have one more question here. Okay. Um, if we only have 10 minutes a day to work out, is there a type of workout that you think would be best? I think it's the workout you're going to do. And I know that sounds oversimplified and it's probably a little frustrating, but here's the thing. If you pick what you want to do, what you really like to do for that 10 minutes a day, then what happens after, you know, it, it, it's different for everybody, but I find it can be after a month. It can be after three months or even six months is you'll start finding other things that maybe somebody has told you would be better for you. Like, you know, somebody's told you, well, you need regular cardiovascular exercise. You need regular strength training exercise. You know, the truth is all of us could use all of it, but something is definitely better than nothing. So if you can pick one that you really like, that you really know you're going to stick to for 10 minutes a day, do that, get really, really good at that, and then add something else. But only after you've really gotten good at 10 minutes a day of whatever you start with. Does that sort of make sense? It's a, it's a little backwards different. I shouldn't say backwards. It's a different way of thinking about it. But the whole idea is to get you in that habit, and then you can layer other habits on top of that. I hope that's useful to that person. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, then I think this wraps it up. Um, thank you so much, Amanda. This was, like I said, I learned a lot. So super Good. informative. Appreciate you sharing your evening with us and appreciate everyone on the line um, joining us this evening as well. If you are new to Welcome MD and you're interested in learning more about us, please visit our website at www.welcomemd.com. Welcome does have two L's. Tricky there a little. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. New Year.